Rennie and I had completely different experiences growing up. Rennie grew up in the church. I did not. I want to tell you a story that Rennie has told me, something that happened to her as she was growing up in the church that had a profound impact on her and still affects her to this day in a way that I, I wish had happened to me. Rennie was six years old, and she had some pet chickens, uh, hereafter referred to as chooks, the uh, Australianism that I'm going to be using. She had a couple of, of chooks that she cared deeply about, and one day she noticed that her chooks seemed ill. They were drooping, and they, they really seemed bad, and she was very worried about them, so she went and told her mom. And Rennie was quite emotional about this. Her mom said, okay, well, let's do this. Let's pray about this. So she got down on her knees with her mom, and together they prayed about Rennie's chooks. The next day, Rennie ran out to check on her chooks to see how they were doing, and they, were, they looked great. They were just as healthy as they had ever been before. Well, that may not have been the most important miracle that God ever performed. And I'm sure he didn't care nearly as much for those chooks as he did for a little six-year-old girl learning the power and importance of prayer. And so that was an experience that Rennie had. I didn't have that growing up, and we've compared notes. And for me, learning to pray was a struggle. For Rennie, it came much more naturally because it started in childhood. Well, you may think that I'm going to do a, a split sermon about prayer today, and I'm not. I'm not going to do a split sermon about prayer, but I use that story because it does still fit in with what I want to talk about. Today, we'll be taking a look at some familiar scriptures, uh, but perhaps from a slightly different angle. Our focus will be on the little things that people do that make a big difference, like taking three or four minutes to pray with your child, to teach your child a lesson that will last a, a lifetime and eternity. Let's start by turning to Luke 17. Luke 17. I have to wait for my iPad to get ready. I don't need the internet, but it's telling me the internet's not available. <laughs> Luke 17. This is uh, an encounter that Jesus has. Now, I wanna, before I get into this, I want to say something. I've probably said before, and other people have said this, I'm sure, and you may have read this, but I just want to mention it again, that Luke, as a Gentile, was an outsider, and his gospel is much more concerned with outsiders than, than the other gospels. He likes to look at Samaritans. The parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, occurs only or appears only in the gospel of Luke. He likes to look at those who are... Uh, of different classes that are not as as not in the in group, if you will, not in the in crowd. So he looks specifically at the poor, the disenfranchised, Samaritans, uh, women, children. Okay, we'll start in, in verse 11 of chapter 17. While he, Jesus, was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. <clears throat> so that gives you a quick story. And you see here, it's a Samaritan who is the object here, the, the, the individual who has done something that even the, the Jews among the lepers did not do. Now, when we were reading this, we saw that the lepers who were outcasts, they had to go around. Uh, make, they could not mix with normal society. They were quarantined. Uh, I think we all are quite familiar with that concept. <laughs> they were quarantined from regular society, cut off from society. If they were out moving around and they saw people who were not unclean approaching them, they had to identify themselves as unclean so nobody would come by. You might say, 
COVID-19 here, COVID-19, they, they were saying, unclean, unclean. So when they called at him, they called from a distance, okay? Now, the Levitical law pointed out what, what was required of somebody who had leprosy. <clears throat> if you felt like your leprosy had cleared up, you didn't just say, oh, I'm better. I'll go mix with society. You went and showed yourself to the priest who would examine you, and then he would have you go back home, and there were certain tests and things you had to do. He had to examine you more than once, and finally, you were allowed to mix in with society. Well, in this particular case, Christ tells them, go and show yourselves to the priest. And that's uh, verse 14. And as they were going, they were cleansed. They had to leave on faith to go. So that's an interesting point that you don't want to miss in the story. <clears throat> What's critical to this particular split sermon, however, is what this Samaritan did. The Samaritan, not the Jews, but the Samaritan came back and gave thanks and praise to Christ. It may not seem like that was a big thing, but you know what? It got him into the Gospel of Luke. He's been remembered for 2,000 years for just saying thank you. Little things make a difference. It was important to God, and it should be important to us. <clears throat> I also want to point out one other thing about this, and, and um, Expositors indicates that the, well, first of all, the, the Jews were healed, but the Samaritan was, was made well. There were two separate Greek words here. <clears throat> expositors indicates that the Greek terms for cleansed uh, applied to the Jewish lepers, and that one was um, ikar, ikatharisthia, or whatever. It's like catharsis, okay, but it's Greek. Um, applied to the Jewish lepers, and for made well is to soken applied to the Samaritan leper. Those terms are different in their meaning. The term used for leper is the more comprehensive word, suggesting perhaps that the Samaritan was not merely healed of leprosy, but spiritually as well. So that is an important thought there. <clears throat> the next example I want to take a look at is in Acts 9. And Acts is also written by uh, Luke. Acts 9. Now, this chapter is an interesting chapter. The beginning of Acts 9 is the conversion of Saul. Okay, Up to this point, Saul had been terrorizing the church. Ravaging is a word that is used in Scripture, talking about what Saul was doing to the church. He was zealous. He was persecuting Christians. He was dragging them out of their homes and taking them to the council. He was tearing the church apart. The first part of chapter 9 of Acts is the conversion of Saul. And with the conversion of Saul, the church started doing very well. Not only because they now had a zealous person on their side, but because they didn't have a zealous person against them. <laughs> so it was doing much better. The last part of, of um, it's actually not chapter 9, it's getting into chapter 10, is uh, the episode with Peter and Cornelius. And that is that you know Peter had this vision of the, of the sheet, and he goes and visits Cornelius. Sandwiched between those two episodes of dramatic significance, big things going on, big things dealing with the, the church itself being able to grow and then being able to grow into the uh, going toward the Gentiles are some a uh, couple of little stories. And we're going to focus on one of them. We'll go to verse 36 of chapter nine, <clears throat> verse 36. And we read now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. Why is that important? Luke is very interested in the Greek world and the Greeks' understanding. And so Tabitha is the Hebrew name. Dorcas is the Greek name. He wants the Greeks to understand it. It means gazelle, by the way. So in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at the time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, let me just back up for one second. They had washed her body, but they had not applied oils to it, okay? So they had not completed the process for burial. And it makes you wonder whether they were actually expecting something to happen here, like expecting a resurrection. 
<clears throat> Since Lydda was near Joppa, and uh, Lydda is where Peter was at the time, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. Again, after Tabitha died, they sent to Peter. They weren't looking for healing. They were looking for resurrection, or at least it seems that way. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the windows stood beside him, all the widows, I'm sorry, stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Now, this is an interesting story, but I want you to notice this, okay? This woman was resurrected, and there are several things that happen here. She is mentioned as a disciple. It's the feminine form of the word disciple, okay? Tabitha was not the only uh, female disciple, but this is the only place in Scripture where the feminine form of the word disciple is ever used. And it was that honor fell to Tabitha. Another thing that is critical to this split sermon is what it was that, that why she was loved. She was loved not because she was somebody doing incredible things out there. She was loved because she cared about the widows. She was doing individual acts, lots of little things. She saw and recognized that one widow over here had a need, and she made, made her some kind of article of clothing. She recognized another widow had some, art, uh, some need, and she made her clothing, and it was all quality clothing. But what the widows appreciated most was there was somebody here who cared enough to pay attention to them and, and gave from her heart to them. It was a, these are lots of little acts, little acts that distinguished her so that they wept so much and they sent for Peter to resurrect her. Now, <clears throat> I also want to point out something else. and we'll, We're going to take a look just to kind of see what might have been in Peter's mind. Let's go back to Mark 5. <clears throat> Mark 5, starting in verse 21. This is something that Jesus did, but Peter was right there with Jesus. Mark 5, verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and, and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And then during this journey, there's another healing that happens because a, a woman with an issue of blood touches uh, Christ's robes. And we're going to skip the, through all that, though, <clears throat> down to uh, verse 35. While he, Jesus, was still speaking, they, the people from Jairus' synagogue, or the town anyway, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died, why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. Undoubtedly, this is something that's a little bit different from a modern day. These were professional mourners. Back at that time, I think the Middle East, they still have these, but uh, people would pay professional mourners just to weep and wail and to express grief for them so that everybody would understand that there was a death in the family and how much you cared for that person. But the, the professional mourner didn't have any invested interest the professional mourner was being paid, so the grief was not real. Okay, so anyway, um, and he saw a commotion, the people loudly weeping and wailing. Verse 39, and entering in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. 
Somebody who was truly grieving would not start laughing so easily. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astounded, and I imagine so. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and he said that something should be given her to eat. We can go back to Acts now. Back in Acts 9. And it... Get back to where we were. Um, if you notice in Acts 9, that Peter, when he got there, in verse 40, he sent them all out, just like Christ had done, out of the room. And he knelt down and prayed, turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. Now, we read that in English, and we don't notice that in, in Aramaic, it would have been Tabitha kum, and in Mark, it was Talitha kum, or Talitha, or whatever, however it would be pronounced. One letter of difference. I just point this out to, to the commentator pointed out, is there a possibility that this was in Mark's mind as he performed this? I mean, he, he did it in the same way that Christ did. <clears throat> now, Dorcas was somebody who had a profound impact, not because she did some specifically, her, you know, tremendous, wonderful thing. It was little acts of kindness. But what's interesting is that her example has inspired people through the ages. In the 1800s in this country, there were groups called Dorcas Societies. Dorcas Societies sprang up all over the United States, and that these were women who wanted to emulate Dorcas, and they wanted to do acts of charity and kindness toward others. And so, in a sense, even years, centuries after her death, Dorcas had a profound impact on people. Let's now turn to Mark 6. Now, these, these things I've talked about so far are, are not um, huge things. We tend to think that if, if we want to have an impact on people, we have to do something big. But sometimes the things that we do that are small things, sometimes we may actually have an impact on somebody and not even recognize that we've had an impact on somebody may not even know till the kingdom. Who knows? Mark 6, we have the feeding of the 5,000. All four Gospels include this miracle. It's the only miracle, the only miracle that you will find in all four Gospels. So that tells you something about the significance of this particular one. We're not going to look at all four. We're going to look at two of them. So we're going to start in Mark 6. <clears throat> Mark 6, verses 30, starting verse 33. <clears throat> the people saw them going, and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. What had happened is Jesus was actually, his disciples had returned from going out. He had sent them out um, to, to proclaim the gospel, and they'd come back, and they were worn out. They were beat. They were in need of a little bit of R&R. &R. And so Christ had thought we'd, you know, told them, let's get in this boat. We'll go across uh, the Sea of Galilee, and we'll have a chance for some rest and some quiet. But the people thought, no, no, we're going to catch up with them. They got wind of where they were going, and they walked all the way around, and they hurried. And maybe maybe uh, Christ and the disciples had headwinds that slowed them down. But at any rate, the people beat them there. <clears throat> so, And they got their head of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away so that they can, may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. I mean, the shops are going to close soon. <clears throat> you got to send them away. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. Now, the commentator for expositors points out that Greek has a different kind of system than we do. They have something called an emphatic personal pronoun. We don't have that. So this you is not just you. It's you. You give them something to eat. It's emphatic. 
it was a command to say that the responsibility lies with his disciples. <clears throat> and they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? 200 denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. This is eight months wages. Think about that amount of money. They're not carrying around that kind of money. These are, are um, people among the poor uh, who are Christ's disciples. And even that, even that um, would not be enough. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Now let's skip over uh, quickly to John 6 for the other one, that I the other uh, version I wanted to read. Now, this fish, by the way, were probably not, you know, some whopper-sized fish. These fish were probably small pickled fish, maybe even something like a sardine. <clears throat> and the bread would have been, the loaves would not be huge loaves that you might think of picking up at HEB. The loaves were little flatbread loaves. So five loaves and two fish would be enough for one person's lunch, maybe, Okay. It wasn't enough to, to feed 5,000 men and, and others besides. Now, John has a, a, some, a detail that, that Mark does not have, the other Gospels don't have. So we'll read through it too, okay? Verse 1 of John 6. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing in those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. That's one thing we are seeing here that's different from the other account. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? That's the second thing. The Count Mark just said they had five loaves and two fish. The Count John specifies that it was a lad accompanying them wasn't part of the, the crowd, but it was a young man accompanying them, okay? So you had the, the 12 disciples, but you had others who were part of the core group as well. And this young lad accompanying them was the one who had his lunch and offered his lunch. Now, the two accounts don't contradict. He was part of the group, so Mark's account was right. Yes, they had this much. But John actually specifies that it was a young lad. And... As we said in verses 5 and 6, we see that this was a test, that Christ asked this question as a test. He could have performed the miracle without asking for loaves and fishes. But there was a test here. And the test was, what do you, and in Mark's account, you feed them. What do you have to offer? What can you provide? The test is to look at your own resources no matter how small they are, and to use those resources as the initiation of something that could turn into a miracle. That young lad provided five small loaves and two probably very tiny fish. And that was the basis of Christ's miracle. Christ didn't need that, but that young boy played a part in something big because he did something little. He was willing to do a little thing. <clears throat> when I first began attending church, the very, very first time I ever attended church, it was in Portland, Oregon. It was a long time ago. I'm going to date myself here. It was 1976. I was in college. I was away from home. I had heard about the church before from a friend of mine. I've told you about him before. But I, the church, nearest church was far away. So when I went to Portland, I thought, 
Portland's a good sized city. They probably have a church here. I didn't know much about it. Looked in the yellow pages. And guess what? That year, back during what people have since referred to as the liberal era, that year was the only year, but it did appear in the yellow pages. And so I was able to call, talk to the minister. He told me where church met. The Western States Chiropractic Association, which I still remember because it seemed so odd to me that a church would be meeting there. I found out where it was. It was in northeast Portland. I was in southeast Portland. If I, as a poor, struggling student, had had a car, it would have taken me 10 minutes to drive there. I didn't. So I had to wait at a bus stop, catch a bus. Now, if you know anything about Portland, besides their, the rights they're having now, the downtown area, the center of the city, is on the other side of the Willamette River. So I had to go all the way from southeast Portland to the western side of Portland, get off the bus, wait for a transfer, transfer, and then take a bus on another long ride back out. It took me over an hour. It's like an hour and 15 minutes. I don't remember exactly now, but I remember just really being discouraged at how much time it took. And then I had to walk several blocks from there to get to, the, to my location. So I was not, you know, being a typical grumbling type of American, <laughs> grumbling Israelite. <laughs> uh, when I walked in and, and somebody greeted me and said, hi, you know, we noticed you walked up. Where'd you come from? And so uh, I told them and they said, well, you, did, you walked, so you didn't, you didn't drive. And oh yeah, I didn't have a car. And, oh, it was terrible. I had this bus ride. It was, it was terrible. It was, it was a horrible ride. It took so much time. It's ridiculous. Blah, blah, blah. Gripe, 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 gripe. I don't know whether it was this first person or somebody else, but somebody there went and said, can you wait just a moment? Went off, came back a few minutes later and said, this is so-and-so. He's in charge of rides. In charge of rides. Okay, that's interesting. And then he asked, where do I live? And I told him where I live. And so then um, he said, wait here a minute. He goes off, comes back and said, I want you to meet Kent Worsham. Kent lives close to you. And he is, is willing to give you a ride to church every day, every Sabbath that you want to come. Okay, now it's not what Kent did. By the way, I remember Kent's name because I saw him every single Sabbath, okay? <laughs> These other two gentlemen, I don't remember who they were, uh, okay? But it's not what Kent did. What Kent did, that was a, a large-scale commitment. Every week, he was willing to bring me to church every week. It's not even the guy who had the official position of providing rides to people who needed rides. The person I want to highlight is the very first person in the chain of events. That first person took five minutes. First of all, he listened to a griping stranger. He heard my need and not my obnoxiousness. And he realized what my need was, and he went and got the chain of events started that would help me come to church to correct my attitude. <laughs> okay. I have thought back on that incident many times now, I personally believe that God, when he calls you, is not going to take no for an answer. He's going to keep prodding you in different ways. And if he has to sort of kick you in the rear end, he will. But the point is, had that person not been there at that moment, how much harder would it have been for me to get started attending church? How much longer would it have been before I attended regularly? What other experiences would I have had? Because one person took five minutes, my life was profoundly changed. One little thing. Let's now go to Matthew 25. <clears throat> We're familiar with all these scriptures. I just wanted to point out that this need to think about the little things that happen in life. Now, Matthew 25, some people don't realize this, but you know, Matthew 25 is actually part of what is called the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, the Olivet Prophecy, is Christ speaking. Um, he goes up on the Mount of Olives. His disciples ask him, when will the, the end be? And he gives this prophecy, and then he launches into some parables. Matthew 25 has three major parables, okay? Those parables are all kingdom-related, but it's in the context of his discussion that he just had about end times and how bad things are going to be. So the middle one, after, after the parable of the ten virgins, you have the parable of the talents. And that's what we're going to look at here, okay? Parable of the talents. <clears throat> Verse 14 of Matthew 25. For it, this is interesting, 
It doesn't even say that the kingdom for it, because he had already given one parable on the ten virgins and the kingdom is like, and then he launches right immediately into another one. For it is, it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents of money went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things, with a few things. Now, back then, a talent would have been considered a lot. It was a lot of money, okay? This master considered it little, a little thing, okay? <clears throat> You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have, done, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, before we move on to the last person and his comments, I want to point out something. These people are slaves. They're not in chains. They are not living apparently under any kind of hardship. Yes, they are slaves. It's an it's a institution that we don't comprehend fully uh, today. But the master leaves and he leaves them with great responsibility. And he entrusts this responsibility to them. It doesn't sound like he's a, a real bad guy. Verse 24. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. It's interesting that he has that perspective. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. And I think this, the rest of this verse should be read this way. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. And so we'll stop there. Now... What's interesting, the, the, I looked at the expositors on this, and the expositors commentary uh, talks about these two, the, the parable of the ten virgins and then this parable of the talents being linked together at, by the connective phrase, for example. And he's pointing out that, the, it, well, I'll just read what the quote is. The foolish virgins failed from thinking their part too easy. They thought they could get oil whenever they needed to. It was too easy. The wicked servant fails from thinking his job too hard. Okay. You should just do the Nike slogan, just do it. The principal lesson of the parable is that God expects a return on what he's given us. And some of us may look around and say, he hasn't given me anything. You know, what resources do I have? And if we're thinking just in like personal talents, well, that's wrong thinking. Think more like resources. What resources do I have? Well, what resource did Rennie's mom have? A loving heart toward her daughter to teach her about God and prayer. What resource did this individual who listened to me and went and got the guy who was in charge of rides, what resource did he have? A few minutes of his time to listen to me. What resource did the, the young lad have? He had his lunch. His lunch that he was willing to offer up when Christ asked for it. What resource did Dorcas have? She had the care and the skill in, in sewing that she made garments for the widows in the church, people who had a need. We may not have much, but God can use what little we have. Now, I want to 
end my message today by telling one more story about my mother-in-law. And that goes back to a time that when Rennie and I had, we had been riding each other back and forth. We had met in Argentina, had decided we were going to move forward on our relationship. We had gone our separate ways. She went back to Australia. I came back to the United States and we were making plans for her to come over and for us to, to get moving toward having our life together. Rennie's mom wrote me a card. I got this card and I was kind of surprised to receive a card from her because I had not actually met her in person yet. And I had heard Rennie's um, talking about her mom in her, in her emails and, and probably also when we were in Argentina. So I knew her mom to be a good person. Um, but I had also you know, heard mother-in-law stories and was concerned about whether or not I would be accepted. <laughs> she wrote me a card assuring me that she was very happy that I was in Rennie's life. And I have remembered that card from when I received it because it meant a great deal to me. I'm not the only one who has received a card from her. A lot of people have. And I think that's what Sophie does for her way of reaching out to people. She enjoys that and she's good at it. The point is, God expects us to use the little resources that we have and if we're willing to use those resources, God may just back it up with a miracle.